Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives Anniversary Speaker Series. My name is Stacey Krim, and I'm the Curator of Manuscripts and Special Collections and University Archives. Today, I have the honor of introducing our guest. Erin Larimore is Professor and University Archivist at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she has served as University Archivist since 2011. In this role, she is responsible for collecting, preserving, and promoting the history of UNCG from its earliest create, creation in this, as the State Normal and Industrial School in 1891 through today. She is also the co-creator of Well-Crafted NC, a research project focused on documenting the history of beer and brewing in North Carolina. Her other research interests include community engagement, archival practice, archival outreach, and American archivals, history, and development. Erin holds a bachelor's degree in English from Duke and a master's of science in information studies from the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> Looks like we have a, um, a Zoom bomber. She previously worked as assistant head and curator of special collections and research Collections Research Center at North Carolina State University and as coordinator for acquisitions and processing at the University of Tennessee Special Collections Library. She has been an active member of the Society of American Archivists since 2001 and served on the organization's council from 2016 to 2019. In today's presentation, bringing UNCG's past to the present, building and teaching with university archives, Erin will talk about how UNCG Special Collections and Archives incorporates university history into classroom instruction, as well as other aspects of campus life. Thank you for speaking with us today, Erin. Hi, everybody. I hate to turn my camera on because then you don't get to see a picture of Jasper in his backpack anymore. But um, I'm gonna, like Stacy said, I'm going to talk today with you about um, basically what we do here in university archives in terms of instruction. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'm not gonna read Beth Ann's comments in the chats because as always, they are hilarious and distracting. Um, <laughs> but um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you because I do have some photos that I'd like to have you guys see along the way. Are y'all able to see that? Yes. Awesome. Um, let's see. So um, bringing UNCG's past to present, what are, we, um, what are we thinking about here? Totally, we do this in a lot of ways. I mean, it's the purpose of why we do what we do. Um, and I'm certainly not the only person in our department who does it. In fact, instruction actually is vital across our department integral to all of our jobs, every single person in special collections and university archives. And not just instruction in general, but instruction that uses our university's history and university archives. Um, you know, we incorporate that in different ways, whether someone's teaching about the history of theater or the history of women veterans. Um, the university in a lot of ways and the history of the university and the history of student life or the history of faculty ties into that. Um, both in terms of subject matter, but also just as good exemplars of primary sources. Um, I do want to give a shout out, and I'm not sure if she's on here or not, but to Kathleen Smith, who is, she currently has like five job titles. She's, but the one primarily related to this is, um, she's our instruction archivist. And so Kathleen has done some excellent work coordinating instruction work across the department but also between our department with other folks on campus. Um, we do basically semester by semester scans of the course catalogs to identify classes where we might be able to make an impact and might be able to work with faculty members to provide students with learning opportunities and resources that I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. So just to give you a picture of our instruction and um, 
this is based on some, we'll just say some loose data, but uh, this is from fall of 2019 to spring of 2022. And there's a couple of asterisks. Uh, five of those six semesters are pandemic times um, where restrictions to our, um, how many people could be in our research room led to a lot of issues in terms of being able to physically bring larger classes in. Um, also, a lot of classes transition to online learning. Um, we certainly also transferred a lot of our materials over, or a lot of our instruction over to online learning. But, you know, there's been a lot of change and a lot of sudden change and a lot of change that probably will be sustained during these semesters. But since fall of 2019, our department has taught 376 instructional sessions. And that only counts instructional sessions, library instructional sessions, where we're working with a faculty member to um, bring primary sources or bring our instructional practices into their classroom here on UNCG's campus. And that's a lot of caveats to put on it because we've also taught um, instructional sessions at other colleges. Um, I know personally during that time period, I've also done some instructional sessions at Chapel Hill, um, at Guilford College, and then for an online course at Georgia State University in Atlanta. It also doesn't include courses where a school of faculty were the instructor of record, meaning they were the person who was the faculty member teaching the class. Um, during this same time period, uh, we've had 11 of those classes, um, seven in the LIS program, the Library and Information Sciences program. So those are graduate level courses. Three that I've taught that I'll talk about in a bit in the honors program, so undergraduate classes. And then one that I actually just wrapped up a week ago um, that was a graduate course in the history department. And so, you know, we're making this great impact in bringing not just our materials, but our resources and our um, expertise across campus in a number of different ways and impacting, again, over 8,000 students during this time period. Here's just an example of some of the departments that we work with. Um, I think most people would kind of stereotypically think, oh, we're working with history or English. Um, and we do. Uh, those are kind of some of our heavy hitters, along with library and information sciences. But just for comparison's sake, we taught during this time period 25 courses, um, sessions for the history department. During that same time, we also had 25 course sessions for residential colleges classes. We had 22 for African-American and African diaspora studies. We had 20 for kinesiology. Um, so this is an impact that um, is reaching across campus. We're working with folks in a lot of different ways with a lot of different um, goals in mind. And you know that necessitates a lot of gear shifting across the department. Obviously, again, everyone in the department is teaching these classes. But no two class sessions are just alike. Um, and so, you know, not only are you never teaching the same class twice, but you might not ever be teaching, you know, that 8,100 students that you saw on the previous slide isn't necessarily the same class 10 times. Um, it may be a small number of students in African American studies, and then some more in communication studies, and then some more in educational leadership, and then some honors college students. It's a it's a wide it's a wide range. So to kind of dig down a little bit more to the topic um, at hand, um, we all want to stay on topic. Uh, university history and university archives in the curriculum. Um, how do we how do we bring that in? What what does that mean, and what do we do? What are some examples of how we do that? So one of the things we do is we help our students learn about historical context, um, both here at the university and in the local community. A lot of times this isn't exactly the students coming in and physically getting their hands on archival materials. Um, it's not them learning research skills. It's them learning content. Um, in a lot of ways there, we're taking on the responsibility of being university historians. So not just the university archivist, um, but the person who's kind of teaching about the history of the university. And the history of the university is uh, an interesting, it's an interesting topic to look at because the history of the university sounds very narrow in scope, but if you start thinking about it, the university is really just a microcosm of our greater community, of Greensboro, of North Carolina, of the United States and of the world. Global issues impact people here on campus. And we can use university archives 
as a local way to introduce students to these broader concepts. Um, it also teaches students, teaching students about the history of the university also kind of helps them forge a sense of place and belonging. Um, it positions the students within a broader community. When they learn about, you know, why the EUC is named the Elliott University Center, which I'll be honest, some of them have didn't actually know it was called the Elliott University Center. They just knew the EUC. Um, when they learn the story behind these places, though, I've had multiple students flat out tell me, I annoy my friends all the time by telling them, did you know that this event was held at the EUC in 1968? Um, they can identify these key events and people in university history and they understand the place, they understand the people, and they understand the way that these events in university history and these places in university history and these things they pass every single day, um, both again have an impact on where we are today at the university, but also can have a broader impact on the local history, state history, regional, national history and events. Um, it allows them to make that connection a little bit more easily. So beyond that, we also work with students a lot on identifying and finding primary sources. Um, a lot of our classes reach first year students and introduce them to the ability to find information in particular sources, primary source um, document interpretation and analysis. Some of the courses then build on that and go more into how to dig through an archival collection, which if any of y'all have ever done archival research, it can be an overwhelming process to just have a finding aid and know that there are five boxes and you have to come up with something from that. It's not an easy task. And so we kind of scaffold this approach across, um, across our instruction. Yes, yeah, Patrick says, here's 200 boxes, good luck. Um, you know, we scaffold our approaches in introducing students to interpretation and research um, in this way. And so a lot of these courses kind of fall into English and history, but there are some other classes um, that, that dig into this a little bit deeper. Uh, I work with a residential college class that I'll be talking about in a bit, and we'll show some examples of how we dig in to this interpretation side of things, how we focus on helping these first year students see a historical document, something that's not a published book or a journal article, something that is a letter or a memorandum or a photograph or an oral history interview. How do you take that plus another thing like that, plus another thing like that, and stitch it together to develop a narrative. Um, and again, we'll talk, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. We also talk about examining the context of creation and bias. So how do we critically question the motives behind the production of the records? Like when this document was created, what was going on? What led to its creation? What why did the person create it? And what biases did the person who created it have? Um, you know, one of the things that often pops up when we start talking with students about archives is inevitably there'll be a student who says, well, archives are the truth. They're the raw history. And that's not always, you know, to get hardcore postmodern, that's not a thing. Um, you know, the, the, the truth that you find in archives most often is, a person's interpretation of what they see or saw or felt or um, what happened, but how I might experience something and describe it is going to be completely different from how Shelby might experience or see something. We, you know, our personal backgrounds come into that and it really is going to affect how we're describing what we see, how we're recording what we see, whether we record what we see, and then, um, you know, five, 10, 15, 50 years later, when that ends up in the archives, how someone else who we don't know and who doesn't know us um, might interpret that. So basically, how does your individual background or position or biases impact the, the documents in the archives that we're seeing? Um, you know, that's actually a really useful thing for the students, both in archival research, but it also comes into play when we're talking about like media literacy and being just a good citizen who can, 
think through where your news is coming from and what you're seeing on Facebook and whether it's a reliable source. It kind of falls into that larger, um, larger category. So one of the things I also strongly emphasize to students is the importance of understanding archival silences. So this is kind of the thought of understanding that archival collections are impacted by selection. There's, there's a human being involved in both creating the materials themselves as well as getting the materials to the archives as well as processing the materials to get before it ever even gets into your hands. It goes through a lot of different people. Things can happen along the way, either intentionally or unintentionally that affect what gets to you at the end. Um, you know, we're archivists, we're not hoarders. Uh, we don't collect every, you know, like our goal, our perfect goal is not to have every document ever created, hoarded in a box somewhere. You whittle through the materials. You, you, you have to see, you know, it's a, it's a forest for the trees approach. We kind of call things down so that you can see the big picture. You might not have every single detail. And yeah, it might stink that in 10 years, we realized that this one document that was created by a person who was a student at the time, but we didn't keep their, you know, I don't know, something that they wrote. If they grew up to be Stephen King, that might stink. Um, we might be like, dang, I wish I kept that. But, um, you know, we can't. We, we have limited space. Um, and that's true in the digital world, too. Um, we have made shifts to born digital archiving and keeping digital resources. But, you know, there's not a magical cloud and place to put all things digital, just like there's not a magical space to put all things physical. Um, and so selections are made. But also, we talk a lot about selections that are made on the other side of things before they ever even come to the archives. I don't know if how many of y'all have seen Hamilton. <laughs> um, there's a scene in Hamilton where Eliza Hamilton burns the letters between her and Alexander. She's removing herself from the narrative. And, um, you know, people do that and they do it for, for numerous reasons. They do that because, you know, they do want to actually remove themselves from the narrative for their own personal purposes. Sometimes they do that because it's not safe for their history to be recorded in a way where it can be held against them in you know, a court of law or by um, anyone else in the future. Um, there are power dynamics that come into play in terms of creating records. And then there are just some cultures where record creation and the way we think about it for archives just isn't how history is recorded. Um, there are narrative cultures where that's how stories and histories are passed down is through, you know, you tell the next generation who tells the next generation. And you're never physically sitting down and writing things into a, you know, in a formal way. And so thinking about these silences and how that impacts history and the story we're telling is also super important and something that we emphasize to our students. And then finally, we go into uh, interpreting and integrating these primary sources into um, papers, presentations, other types of things. And this has a lot of complications that some you some you may not think of off the top of your head, but once I say them, you'll go, oh yeah. Um, you know, one piece of this is helping students learn how to read cursive handwriting. Um, that's a challenge, and I'll be honest, it's a it's a challenge for any of us. I um, yeah, as Patrick said, he still struggles. I I do too. Um, you know, there's there's some handwriting that's beautiful to read. Um, there's some handwriting that is not beautiful to read. Um, there's some handwriting that is so tiny and chicken scratchy that no one can ever read it. And then there's even questions where um, Sean mentioned Civil War letters. A lot of times during the Civil War or other places and times when um, there was, you know, not ready access to paper, people would actually write and then turn the paper 90 degrees and continue writing. Um, so you even have writing on top of writing and you have to kind of honestly use a piece of paper, another piece of paper kind of scrolled over that to help read the lines. It's, it's not easy. And it's not simply, you know, teach cursive and we'll all be cool. Um, 
you know, reading these documents can be, can be a challenge. Um, but we also want to teach them how to take these primary sources, these, these kind of raw documents from history, and combine them with secondary sources, textbooks, um, other materials that are published um, by other, you know, interpret other people's interpretations and kind of put them in a conversation with each other so that they can think about, you know, questioning a secondary source. It, it, one of the things that I've seen students realize that always kind of makes me smile is a lot of them will come in thinking, oh, I was told this official narrative. I, you know, I read this on the official university website, so it must be true. It's the whole entire story. But then they start seeing these primary source documents and they start asking questions and they start realizing not only that there are questions that can be asked, but that like they legitimately can be the people who ask them. It gives them that power to, um, to question what they might've considered some sort of authority, um, like be all end all authority source. Um, and then we also, of course, give them a lot of uh, experience and lectures on acknowledging and citing sources of information. Um, that can be, it, it, honestly, that's tricky in any situation. I, there's nothing I hate more than having to think about like how to format a footnote in whatever guidelines that particular journal is going to force me to use. It annoys me. But, um, you know, citing your sources and tracking your sources as you're doing research. And this is particularly interesting and important for students who are doing long term research. So masters, PhD students or even undergraduates who are working on independent research or um, you know, some sort of honors paper or something like that. Tracking as you do your research where the materials are coming from. And again, it kind of all goes back to that context. Where did you get this and what was the context in which you found it? Um, context is a really big thing to archivists. We maintain context at all times in terms of keeping collections together, in terms of trying our best to um, maintain and demonstrate how the person who created the collection kept it. All of that gets factored into what we do. And we teach the students about that and about how important that is, both when, they, again, when they're using the information to, to create their narrative or whatever it is that they're developing. So an example, please. Um, this is one of my favorite classes that I work with. Um, I've worked with Dr. Sarah Colonna, who is now um, the Assistant Director of Grogan Residential. Oh, hey, Sarah, Sarah's here. Um, so <laughs> she can correct me if I say anything wrong. Um, so I worked with Sarah for many, 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 many years now, um, going back to when she was working on her dissertation. Um, but, one of my favorite classes that I work with every year is her uh, residential college class in Grogan. Used to be 189, now it's 215. It's the same class. The theme though is the question of, of education. And so this is a class where Sarah has done some great work to kind of divide it into three chunks. One's focused on local, one is focused on, or personal, one is focused on local, and one is focused on global. Um, and they're looking at questioning education and building their ability to question their education through these different lenses as they go along. So I come in during the local portion of that. Um, and we talk a lot about university history and how the university that hopefully they will graduate from um, is, is kind of factoring into to what, to this bigger picture of, of their, their education and education as a whole. So students begin this section with um, an exploration of UNCG's past. First, 
they get subjected to a series of guest lectures. Um, probably not the most exciting piece to them, but it really is the part that grounds, it builds that foundation for building forward. Um, so they first start with an initial introduction to campus history where they're given a very basic and broad overview of the development of the university, um, focused on the university from 1891 when it was initially chartered through now. Um, I always tell them it may replicate a lot of what they heard as part of a campus tour or during their orientation um, or what they read on the UNCG website. It's a story that's intentionally in some ways superficial. It's just an overview um, and it's as straightforward as possible because after we do that, we move into two more sections where we're complicating that history. We build on it with two follow-up lectures. The first of those is, follow, is focused on the history of African-Americans at UNCG from its founding through the present. So that starts with a conversation of um, African-American workers who were here well before the campus desegregated in 1956. Um, the students have to listen to me talk about Ezekiel Robinson at length, um, but also all of the other people who are fundamental to making sure that this university honestly survived and just functioned on a day-to-day -day basis for its first 60 years. Um, we talk about the student experience with Joanne Smart and Betty Tillman coming to campus as the first two black students in fall of 1956. We talk about um, student involvement in the civil rights movement, the history of the Neo Black Society, um, the history of African-American and African diaspora studies. These are all aspects with where with the exception of um, campus desegregation, it's not typically included in kind of a general discussion of university history. These aren't things that are normally talked about on the campus tour. Um, and so we add on to that. And then my colleague Stacy, who popped up to do an introduction, comes in and does a second presentation, um, university history through an LGBTQ plus lens. Um, both uh, queer students and faculty and staff. And so these are lectures that are intended not only to provide additional and valuable information to the students, um, but also to introduce them to the idea of perspective in historical research and storytelling. We actually start asking why are many of the key people and events that are included in the African-American or LGBTQ plus presentation why are they not included on the general campus tour? Why aren't they talked about? Um, whose viewpoints are, are included? Whose viewpoints are talked about? And whose viewpoints are either intentionally or unintentionally silenced in kind of our popular history on campus? And so we start helping the students realize that there are multiple histories. There's not like one right answer to history. Um, and, and, and that multiple perspectives can lead to multiple histories. And so that leads to a project called the Three Perspectives Project, which is one of my favorite things. Um, if you, let's see, I'll put this in the uh, chat too, assuming I typed it right. Um, if you go to that link, it's gonna open up a PDF document that's actually, uh, it's, it's basically the, packet of information that I put together for one of the groups of students um, on this three perspectives project. Um, in this assignment, students are divided into small groups of three or four, somewhere around there, and they're given a curated pack packet of documents on a single topic in university history. Um, they have a wide range of topics um, that includes desegregation of the university in 1956, student participation in the Woolworth sit-ins of 1960, which is the packet that you have at that link, and a student-led protest of local businesses on Tate Street in 1963. Each packet contains about a dozen or so primary source documents that I selected, as well as one of our Spartan stories, um, a short contextual essay that's around the designated event. Um, these are all events that they heard about in one of the previous lectures, but you know, it never hurts to have something written out in front of them while they're going through the documents themselves. And so these documents um, represent three perspectives. Um, perspectives of different individuals who typically impact or were impacted by 
the university's actions and decisions around this event or this topic. So they'll see the perspective of a student. So here it's a clip. Um, they actually get a copy of an oral history interview with one of the uh, white students from Women's College who participated in the Woolworth sit-ins. They get perspectives of campus administration. Um, uh, this is from a newspaper article um, talking about Chancellor Blackwell, who was urging the students to have a patient attitude and basically not to participate in the protests, but to wait for other things to happen. And then the third perspective is someone who's not related to the university directly, but is in some way, shape or form um, involved in this event. So here you have a, uh, um, a little picture from Curly Harris's. He was, Curly Harris was the manager of the Woolworths. He was very much of the opinion that if people had just asked nicely, he would have happily let people come sit at his counter. Um, we, we have these diaries as part of the collection. And so the students have all of these documents, some of which are from the time, some of which are reflections on the time. So Curly Harris's report was written his, his personal screed was written, I want to say, in early 80s, if I remember right. The oral history interview was done in about 2010. So again, this was 1960 is when this event happened. And I tell students all the time that, you know, if you ask me about my experiences in high school now, I probably am going to give you a significantly different answer about whether or not I enjoyed high school than I would have given you in when I was 18 years old. Um, you know, I'm going to remember different things and for better or worse, I'm going to remember them in different ways. And so, you know, we start talking about all of these things and we start talking about um, how all of this comes together to just make it so that, that a, a narrative of students went to the lunch counter and sat there and then everything magically was desegregated and now we're the most diverse campus in the UNC system of the historically white schools. It's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and so we work really hard to make sure students are able to kind of think through that um, and use these packets to, to practice their critical thinking and analysis skills. Um, the students do a presentation at the end of this where they then share their efforts with, um, with their classmates. They talk about the diff different perspectives that were in their packet and they talk about um, why the perspectives differ. So the second part of these students visit to uh, university archives focuses around the creation of a biographical poem. Um, this is again, another kind of easy way, um, and not necessarily easy, but I wanna say user-friendly way of getting students to, to dig into these documents and to think through the bigger picture questions. Um, it's not asking them to write, you know, a 15 page historical analysis of something. Um, it's focused on helping them to navigate an archival collection and help them to use these resources to pull out various um, various bits and pieces. And so you see there on the screen kind of the uh, structure, the pattern that they follow for their poem. Um, for this, instead of the curated packet that I provided the students for three perspectives, they typically will either get a very small manuscripts collection. And by that, I mean like one box, not 200 boxes. Um, or they get uh, a few selected folders from an archival collection. Um, but they are dealing with having to dig through things that weren't purposely selected because they would help tell a story. They have to use these resources and they have to determine what helps to tell their story. And so, you know, again, it's, it's really kind of building them, um, this scaffolding on top of what we've already done, um, using the skills that they learned in terms of critical analysis and, you know, thinking about complicated histories to then dig, you know, start kind of the first phase of what we might think of as hardcore archival research, um, recognizing these critical themes and making these inferences. So at the end of the semester, um, actually throughout the entire time, 
Dr. Colonna has the students do some student reflections, um, thinking about what they've learned. And a lot of students reflect on how their deeper knowledge of university history helps them feel a greater sense of connection on campus. Um, others talk about um, how the stories of, of these bold students who made substantive changes on campus and then in the local community, how that really inspires them. Um, you see some of the quotes here. These are some of my favorites, but I will tell you my absolute favorite is one, and this is from way back. Um, the student's name was Maggie and she was studying to be a teacher. And she wrote that education is about recognizing the holes or half truths in our textbooks and seeking out the full story. Our local communities have a rich history that if one digs deep enough holds truths and perspectives one would not normally expect. This was illustrated in RCO 215 perfectly by learning about many perspectives on segregation in the archives and learning UNCG's history with different kinds of minorities. I learned, however, stopping at the things we are exposed to is a mistake. And so we must look further beyond our own school, city, state, country, and perspective. This student wins the prize for actually doing, like basically, saying the thing that anyone teaching a class like this wants a student to say. Um, you know, it's, it really does kind of exemplify why we do archival instruction and why our work doing this is so important. But wait, there's more. Um, yes, the Grogan students are amazing and I love them, but our experiences focus also on instruction and teaching students um, and providing them with um, experiences outside of the traditional classroom. So one thing I love to talk about, which again, exemplifies why Grogan students are awesome, is um, how we function as a lab space. I, I always say we're, we're a place for students to experiment and find ways to apply their classroom learning and personal experiences um, in a research setting, in the same way that a chem lab can do that. We provide internships, practicum experiences, and part-time student employment opportunities that range um, in experience from, you know, arra arranging and describing archival collections to curating physical exhibits, digital exhibits, managing social media, doing oral history interviews, tons of opportunities for students to gain practical skills that they could then take out not only to work in another archives or cultural heritage institution, but like oral history interviewing, for example, is a skill that is useful if you're applying for a job and are doing oral history interviews or doing interviews. Everyone interviews for a job. Being able to ask questions and critical follow-up and listening critically, it's a pretty useful skill to have when you're trying to sell yourself and get a job. Um, you know, it's useful if you want to be a journalist. It, th there's so many kind of practical ways to apply the experiences they can first find here in the archives. Um, so what you see there is actually a poster and a little photo from spring of 2019. Um, this was back when the campus had their big overarching topic that was focused on the 1960s, um, exploring the limits. Uh, so we actually, Sarah and I actually got some funding to uh, fund a graduate student in public history who was assisted by two undergraduate students from Grogan to build an exhibit in uh, Hodge's reading room. They were student curators and they were paid a stipend from the funds, um, a grant that was through the Interdisciplinary Collaboration Committee. So what these students did was they combined reflections and poems from previous collaborations um, in that instructional opportunity that I talked about earlier with Grogan. They combined all of this together along with some primary sources, original documents from the archives to build an exhibit that they called UNC Greensboro Back to the Future, the story of the 1960s and the changes that impact UNCG today. So they were really looking at kind of the enormous social changes that arose during the 1960s, but also looking at how UNCG students reflect on the past and have feel like they're building on it. So they explored things like campus desegregation, the civil rights movement, and the trans transition from women's college to UNC Greensboro. So the coeducational aspects. 
And so these students were able to, again, take what they learned in class, but have a product at the end, have this exhibit. And we had an opening, what you see there in the top corner is Curtis uh, visiting and learning from one of the student, uh, one of the student curators about what is in the case. They got the opportunity to talk to people one-to-one -one at a curator exhibit um, opening and, and really show off their work and to talk through everything. And so on top of that, we also work a lot with students on independent research projects. These are student-driven research projects. Sometimes they're started in class um, and continued independently, but sometimes, honestly, we've got awesome students. It's just a student who has a question that they want to answer and they want to dig into it and they want to find an answer. Um, so this summer, we're actually hosting the first ever University Libraries Undergraduate Research Fellows. We have two undergraduate research fellows. One is a first year student. One is actually graduating in, uh, in August. Um, they're focusing on things related to university archives, but coming from completely different perspectives. One is looking at hidden histories and untold stories on campus and how we might commemorate those in a physical, visible way. The other is actually looking at ways to gather and preserve student created memes and other content that relates to student life on campus. But as someone who is twice the age of the students, I'm not going to know anything about, you know, what they're talking about or even where they're creating these resources. And so she's looking at kind of how those could be gathered together to build something that um, could, uh, in some ways could serve as kind of like a digital version of a yearbook um, where it's documenting the year from a student's perspective in an unofficial way. But the picture that you see there is Abigail Knight. And I think her work here um, really exemplifies the way we can reach a lot of different students, as well as the way that um, archives and university history can be super duper relevant, even when we don't know it. Um, so in the fall of 2019, Abigail began her research into the 1918 uh, flu pandemic on the state normal and industrial college campus in an honors college seminar that I was teaching. She was awesome and she really wanted to go further into that. So Abigail is a nursing student who um, also is interested in anthropology and history. And so she has that interest. She, she, she's training to be a nurse, but she's really interested in history and how nursing got to where it is. And so she wanted to go further with this and she got funding from the um, Undergraduate Research Scholarship and Creativity Office here on campus, ERSCO. And she began expanding her work in January of 2020, basically taking the resources she found here about how State Normal addressed the 1918 flu pandemic and then going to Chapel Hill and to NC State and to see how the pandemic affected those campus those campuses and start to question, you know, why they were different. Um, how did gender dynamics play into that? Um, how did class differences play into that? How did location play into that? So, you know, little did we know when she started this further research in January of 2020 that we wouldn't get very far before the whole world shut down um, and facility closures and access limitations limited her ability to go to the archives at Chapel Hill. Um, but she was able to do a significant amount of work and she presented that work um, at the spring 2020 undergraduate research symposium here on campus and actually won first prize um, in the humanities for her work um, that she titled War on the Home Front, Responses to the Influenza Pandemic of 1918 at three North Carolina colleges. And that Go link that you see in the corner, if you want to uh, see Abigail's presentation, it's, it's there. Um, you know, currently it, it was really interesting to work with her on that because the campus all of a sudden in late spring 2020 was really interested in publicizing information about how the campus dealt with the previous massive pandemic that shut everything down 100 years before. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, Abigail was officially accepted into the School of Nursing. She was learning online how to, you know, take someone's blood pressure in preparation for starting her hospital work in the fall. Um, 
And she went from being a student who was publicized on the university website in front of the archival stacks, um, doing her research, her historical research, to the following year in the spring when we started giving vaccines on campus, her picture was one of the first ones that showed up of one of the nursing students helping with the vaccination clinic that was held here on campus. So it really does demonstrate, again, this broad impact that we could have um, instruction in the classroom, but also beyond. So that's my full spiel about that. I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Um, you know, like I said, this is really a collective effort. We've got so many people in our department who work so hard to make sure that our faculty are supported in this work, um, but also that our students are supported and that our students are given opportunities to ask questions and to learn, whether it's in a classroom or outside of the classroom. And so um, a number of those folks are also in this presentation. So they might can chime in with some answers to questions you may have too. Karen, I have a question. Okay. Um, can you talk about, you gave a few examples, but can you talk about um, any memorable experiences working side by side with students in classes? Um, I mean, it's always, it's always great to work with students and, you know, I, one of the things that is one of my favorite experiences is working as the instructor of record for an honors college class once a year. Um, it's a class focused on university history and digital storytelling. It's usually a very small class, um, somewhere between five and 10 students. So, you know, that's kind of a dream situation in a lot of ways too, but, um, because of that class size, you really do get to know the students personally. And we really can tweak, honestly, we tweak the syllabus as we go along based on who's in the class. And so it's always super exciting to watch the students as we go through the semester. You know, even in a semester like this, where you know that the students are struggling, um, we have a lot of students who are struggling in a lot of different ways, and it's not just because of COVID. Um, but even doing that, kind of knowing more about what's around them and knowing more about what came before them, it excites them. And these aren't history majors. I've literally never had a history major in that class. Um, very few, actual, actually very few humanities students in that class at all. Um, I get a lot of nursing students. I get a lot of um, communication studies students. Um, it's, it's usually a nice hodgepodge of majors, but watching them just get excited to learn about what's around them is, it's, it's why I bother doing it. It's always fun. We have a question in chat. Um, are the materials the students are producing being preserved in the archives? Uh, some. Some are not though, because honestly, FERPA would come into play with a lot of them. Um, student produced materials can't necessarily, can't really be preserved without student consent, or at least they're not supposed to be. Um, just like when we get a faculty member's papers, if, uh, if their records, if they have a bunch of old student papers, we shouldn't be keeping those unless we have the consent to keep them. So for my um, honors college class, we produce a website every year. Um, that's our kind of our final group project and we maintain that. But I also have a conversation with the students about that and about, um, about honestly the fact that they don't have to put their name on it and it doesn't have to be something that in 10 years when they're applying for a job and someone Googles their name, it shows up. Um, so uh, yes and no. Suzanne has a question. Suzanne can't unmute herself. Do you want to just shout really loudly from your office and I can see if I hear it? You're, you're unmuted, Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I kind of panicked. Um, I, I was just wondering, Erin, and this is just kind of more of a personal 
uh, question for you as you prepared um, or as you got prepared for this job. Did you have an experience like this as a student with archives? Like what kind of drew you into this work? Was it a great experience kind of recognizing history or, or wondered if you could share a little more about that? Yeah, so my first introduction to archives was as an undergraduate student. Um, I, uh, but not in a history class. Um, the very first archival research I actually did was as part of a first year writing course that we were all required to take. And so I wrote something about the Washington Duke statue that sits in front of the chapel. Um, I don't know, I don't know why I remember that. But uh, my junior year, I believe it was, I took a course with a professor named Kathy Davidson, who I believe she's at Chicago now, but she does a lot of work with um, digital humanities. And she was an English professor, still is, who um, really, context was really important. And so the course we were taking was one where it was just focused on like every week we had a different novel from the Victorian era, an American novel from the Victorian era, um, which is not my favorite time for novels. Um, but she broke us into small groups and had us go into the archives. And it started each week started with the, the Tuesday of the week was actually a student led presentation on the historical context using the resources in uh, what's now the Rubenstein Library at Duke. Um, you know, my, my group actually, we, we read uh, The Awakening, Kate Trippan's The Awakening, and did a presentation about women's rights and women's suffrage um, at the turn of the century and uh, medicine and healthcare. It was kind of just looking, looking at the state of women and all of the topics that are hit on in The Awakening. Um, other students were talking about the Wilmington uh, uprising, race riots, horrible things that happened in 1898, um, which when this happened in 1998 or 97, uh, the city of Wilmington wasn't really talking about this in any way, shape or form. Um, and so the students actually went to Wilmington just one weekend and started asking around and couldn't find anyone who had ever heard of um, the horrible things that happened in Wilmington. Um, that said, when I finished undergrad, I also the whole entire time was working in the athletic department. I worked in sports information, which is basically the media relations and PR wing of an athletic department. I went to the University of Texas. I worked in the athletic department there where I was the sports information director for men's and women's swimming and diving, volleyball and softball. Um, so it's not the most direct route that most folks take to working in archives. But while I was doing that, we actually had an intern from the library school um, who's now the state archivist for the state of Virginia, um, <laughs> who was working with us. And I just started talking to Mike about what he was doing and the archives program. And then I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. David Gracie, who was like, I see, I, I don't know if anyone else here has ever had the pleasure of hearing or meeting Dr. Gracie, but he will, he passed away a couple of years ago. He could have convinced anyone that their ultimate dream job was to be an archivist and that it was the most important job on earth. I always called him an archival evangelist. And so um, once he had his hooks in me, uh, I wasn't going anywhere. Um, but yeah, it was a little circuitous route, but you know, I've actually found that having a public relations background in archives and in the library field, it's not a background that most folks have. And I'm not like a super extroverted person, but you learn about strategic, um, strategic ways to tell stories and to grab people's attention. Um, and and I, I, that comes in really handy in this field. Do we have any other questions? A lot of thanks in the chat. Well, all right, if you have no more questions, I want to thank Erin for speaking with us today and talking about how integral uh, archives and instructions has been. <laughs>
No, thank you, Beth Ann. I think we're covered for that. <laughs> thank you, Erin. Thank you all. Have a good day.